Hello, and welcome to episode eight of Foggy with a Chance of Seagulls. As always, I'm Evan, and I'm joined by my friend Clark. Clark, how are you doing this week? I'm doing pretty good. Um, I mean, the focus of our podcast is Giants baseball, and that's been pretty bad this week. So <laughs> other than other than our offense not being able to score any runs and our pitchers not necessarily stopping the other team from scoring, I've been pretty good. How are you doing? You know, I'm good. I'm good. You know, settling into this place. Obviously, I still don't have my mic set up. I've lost a stash. So, you know, we're, we're entering <laughs> into a new era. Um, I'm kind of, I've been recruited to join the Yankees. And so, uh, of course, <laughs> I had to the facial hair, had to go. Nestor was like, you could keep the facial, but I was like, you know, it doesn't feel like it's time. Um, and I just want to respect this beautiful, um, classy organization. Um, <laughs> but I, I thought, yeah, well, I think, you know, this is a Giants podcast at the end of the day. Um, and I think that it's, um, you know, I, I was talking with my family this week, with my brother and my mom, and Ryan is a Giants fan too, my brother, but doesn't like, I don't know, he follows, but he follows a lot of other sports at the same time. So he's not necessarily like plugged in, in the way that um, we're both plugged in, in the way that you're plugged in. I mean, maybe closer to the way that I'm plugged in. But um, he was like, so the Giants are kind of mid, huh? And I was like, <laughs> and this is after the A's series, which, Ooh. you know, and after the D-back series. And it was interesting. So I was kind of like, well, you know, they're not they're not made. I mean, they're they're They have the third best record in the national league as commenters <laughs> are, are, are quick to point out. Um, but I think it's maybe worth um, just like taking a big picture look at this team. And, you know, in the first half of the season, you can kind of get by on, um, on just wait and see small sample size. Do you know what I mean? And then at a certain point, in the season, it kind of, you crystallize into like who this team is going to be and who they are and how we'll remember them probably. Um, so yeah, I thought maybe we could just like talk through that a little bit. Yeah. I, I would say mountains and valleys is kind of the first mm-hmm. thing that comes to mind when talking about this giant squad is some of these streaks that we've been on. And I remember to start the year before Evan and I had the brilliant idea to start recording our conversations we were talking one of the first couple weeks and you went to the yankee stadium series you went to that second game um Mm -hmm. to open the season and i mean we started off so rough but even game to game it was like in the first inning you could tell what team was showing up if we hit the ball like (laughs) as simple as that if we made contact with the ball in the first inning, it was like, oh, all right, this team might score some runs. And we'd hit like mm. six homers and put up 10 runs. And then the next game, it would be strikeout, strikeout, strikeout. And it's like, okay, I, I can I can tune out of this one. I, I know what's going to happen. Right. We're going to put up one run and it will be the hardest earned one run ever. And we'll lose 7-1. <laughs> and, you know, I think we got distracted a little bit, especially when the kind of the youth movement happened. Um, And some of these guys are so exciting when they came up, but like the big leagues are really hard. And for guys who are 21 and 24, like you're not going to be a difference maker unless your name is Patrick Bailey and you're a freak behind the plate. But like, (laughs) even still, you know, he's gone through some really rough spells at the plate. He's made some errors behind the plate too. So I think, this season is in a bigger picture. I think this current streak is showing what's been going on the whole season. Um, but if you haven't been tuned into like each peak and valley, each one feels like this huge, this huge deal and that it's so significant. And I think the truth is really somewhere in the middle. I don't know. How are you feeling? Yeah, no, I mean, I think I was reflecting this week, on the fact that, you know, we haven't been doing this for that long, but we've been doing it for eight weeks now. This is our eighth mm-hmm. eighth week doing it. And um, like we came in on a peak, on yeah. one of the highest peaks of the season. And, um, you know, baseball is like, um, 
I feel like it's like a toxic partner or something. It's like, you know, at its best, you're like, there's nothing better in the world. Our team is going to win the World Series. You just like get these good feelings and kind of, you know, and then um, and then you hit the valley, especially after the peak. And it feels like rock bottom in some way right. or something. And it feels so um, destitute. And yeah, I mean, I think you made a good point that the major leagues are really hard. Like, <laughs> I think that um, and we've really leaned on a lot of um, our depth this year, which is, I think, one of the great successes of the season and one of the reasons that we're not like firing in all cylinders right now because I was just recently watching um, some clips of uh, Chris Rose did an interview with Stephen Brault. I don't know if you saw that at all, but um, mm-hmm. the former pitcher who's trying to make a comeback as an outfielder in independent ball. And um, it was just um, the way he talked about, I, I don't know. It was like, it was almost brutal the way that Rose was like asking him these questions of like, you know, you used to get a whole spread and then now is it like PB and J time? And he's like, yeah, you know, I share a house with five other people and just all this stuff. And like, I don't know, like it's, you can be there for, and then, and then you're out. And he was talking about this thing of like, you know, you get sent down and you're like, well, I'm better than these. I'm better than this guy. I'm better than this guy. I'm better than this guy. But it's just like, it has to be such a perfect storm of um, it's a right time for you in this organization. It's a right time for you. You've developed enough to be able to like succeed at the, at the big league level and all these things. That, and, and anyway, I, I feel like, you know, the, the things that sustained that peak were the youth was the youth movement and the hope that that brings. Um, but um, yeah, I, I think, that it's not a surefire thing that it's going to um, work right off the bat. And I think, you know, we've seen that with so many different players over the years that they come up for a bid and then have to get set back and come back. And, you know, it's because I'm still clinging to some of those good feelings uh, to that toxic ex. <laughs> I feel like I'm like, um, you know, Ramos is coming up. He had his homer is like, is he a guy? But um, ultimately, the question of is this guy a guy is kind of an unanswerable question. It's like right. you just have to let time pass and see if these guys can hold up, uh, you know, long term. And um, I know we talked about this, too, but the thought that came to mind is like for a team with a lot of peaks and valleys, it's kind of I think um, I think that sometimes happens when there's not um, there's not those like main a tier B tier players that you have that like can sustain you through and be consistent. The Otani's, the judges, the, you you know, yeah. But, but then it's weird because I don't know, do you, do we believe in fate? I'm not sure, but I think (laughs) then that's a different question, but I think you look at the seasons that Correa, um, Carlos, uh, judge Aaron, um, and you know, like, (laughs) like these types of players have had, and it's like, I don't know. Like we would not have been better off with them. Yeah. I mean, like judge, like plays like an MVP when he's on the field, obviously, but like, um, you know, Cray has been fine. Radon's barely play. It's just like, it's interesting to like, to look at our starting pitching and our offense. And it's like plug in the best free agent that we were pursuing and our season doesn't really change. So I kind of feel like this team is who this team is and it's capable of more than it's doing right now, but it's not that different than, the on-field results i feel in fact i would argue if we plug those free agents in we don't sign some of the other guys we did sign and like people are not going to be super behind me on this but like manaya and stripling are still better than what we would have gotten from carlos Rodon this year yeah last that's year crazy. that was not true but you know this is what i i think is really intelligent about this front office and I don't think they get enough credit for is being able to project forward rather than look back. And that was something that those world series teams of the giants stopped doing because you had to kind of reward the guys Mm, that mm -hmm. got you there and won you these championships. But like Matt Cain, Lincecum, like they got, you know, they got contracts that 
they didn't end up living up to after these World Series or after the first couple. And we didn't end up bringing Bumgarner back when Farhan first took over. And that looked like an incredible decision because if we were still on the hook with Bumgarner's contract and trying to fit him into this weird rotation, yeah, it'd be tough. I mean, it's already a struggle with Alex Wood, who had some really interesting comments after Saturday's game being like, yeah, I'm pitching for the third time in five days and I don't really know when I'm going to pitch. They just kind of tell me and he's like, I, I'm happy to go out there for these guys. Like, I love this team. But you can tell in these quotes, he's like pretty annoyed with the, you know, the usage of him. But if you look at his ERAs, he's not being an effective starter. So this team is not going to keep plugging you into that hole if you're not delivering. And, And I think that's, you know, part of baseball and part of the adjustment. But I don't know. Um I think part of the frustration with this team too, because you're like, well, if you just did the simple thing, they would be better. And I, it just does yeah. not work that way. Well, I think <clears throat> I think it's interesting because lately when we talk about this team, it's less with, you know, it's less with peak mindset. It's with Valley mindset kind of, and um, not Valley girl, but just Valley mindset. And I think <laughs> that um, it, it, it makes me think about just like, what it what it means to be a fan of a team and also like which i know is a very basic thought but just i think that we um for me for me personally like my mom can test this but i'm pretty sure i started following the giants like in 0203 i think i hadn't mm-hmm. really up until that point that much maybe like here and there but um that's what really got me pulled in but then you know a large part of my Giants fandom was watching bad teams and, you know, in this um, Bonds era, post Bonds era up until the World Series. And then um, obviously we had, you know, five years of being blessed. And then, um, but even, even, even within those, you get 2011, um, you know, you get every other year bullshit that we would joke about at the time. (laughs) Exactly. But But then, yeah. And then since, since like, you know, and we were competitive in 2016 ish and then, you know, and then in the past few years, there's only been so much to, um, to look at. And, and I think, you know, when you talk to, excuse me, like non sports fans or whatever, I think that there's, and often for myself too, I find that there's like this whole, my emotional state depends on if this team wins or loses. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? And like, I think that it's still like, I think that we are able to take a little bit more of a healthy look at things, despite the fact that we literally have a podcast about this team. But I think that, um, I don't know. I I just think that that's an interesting decision that you have to make as a sports fan is like, how much do I let this team and their well being like (laughs) enter my, you know, be the deciding factor of my happiness or something. And um, I don't know. This is something I I struggle with all the time. I personally put way too much into sports um, and it just, it, it's never worth it. (laughs) It's never (laughs) worth it. Um, And it's worth it for the highs, but I think there's this almost like toxic relationship we have with sports teams where it's like, if you are a bandwagoner, that means you're a fake fan. You don't get to enjoy the highs the way that I did because I suffered. And it's like, I don't know if you, if you wanted to go on a walk instead of watch the Giants strike out eight times in a row, like who's to say you're not still a real fan? You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah, yeah. And we were talking before this episode about just some of the teams that we've followed, both the Giants, but also other Bay Area sports teams who have just been like rough watches and how to manage your like enjoyment of the team, how to still kind of brand yourself as a fan of the team while maybe not being as clued in as you would be say during a dynastic run, which we've had the privilege of following in baseball and basketball and a pretty successful football team too of late. So, um, yeah, what is flipping it back to you, I guess, um, what's like, what's an example or, or what stands out for you of 
kind of how to handle a bad season. With the caveat, Giants are still like eight games over 500. So this isn't a yeah. bad season, but yeah. it's just a bad like eight days of baseball. Yeah. No, I th- I feel like it's this thing of... Um... Well, a couple of things come to mind. I think that, um, you know, for a long time, I think especially just living on the East Coast and I like I want like when I was in Boston and living there and the way that I I think that I I had like needed to maintain my relationship with the Giants because it was like a thing connecting me back home. And so like mm-hmm. I kind of I feel like I. I lived and died by the the wins and losses. Do you know what I mean? So I like, I've been there too. And I think that even now, do you know what I mean? It's like the way that we're talking about it is not in this jubilant way of like, aren't sports amazing? Isn't baseball amazing? Do you know what I mean? Um, well, you've mentioned but, too, if I can interrupt real quick, you've mentioned too, like how fun it is to wake up and be like, oh, we won again. Like, and yeah, what a yeah. dopamine rush that is. So, right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think that it's like, it, it, there's a certain level of like codependency I think that like sports fans have with the team because it's like you know it's like like you were mentioning a real sports fan tunes into every game knows everything about the team you know uh, ride or die rain or shine you're showing up um and I think um I don't know that there's there's like two different ways that that can go kind of i feel like it's like you can then decide at that point if you're doing that engaging in that way is this am i in control of the situation or is you know are is sports in control of me and i think there's two versions of it there's one that's like codependent um like boyfriend (laughs) and girlfriend or something you know what i mean Mm -hmm. and then on the other side there's like a more marriage style relationship with sports where it's just like, this is just part of my life and I commit to it every day in a new way, with just like a fresh person <laughs> with a fresh perspective. And um, yeah, I don't know. I just feel like for me, life is hard enough already and there's enough <laughs> things to worry about, you know, just in family, friends, relationship, career, what's going on in the world. And it's just like, I just find it difficult at this point to like truly invite like feeling like destitute about a team. And like um, you, you'd mentioned this um, before we started recording, but like, you know, this Rangers series is such an interesting thing to examine because it's just, you know, it's pitting the biggest head against a pretty big (laughs) head as well. And, and, but it kind of shows, it's just like a perfect, like, metaphor for the state of the franchise just like looking at the past and 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 you know um contrasting it with the present and can be our callers are losing their minds and i think our hosts are losing their minds yeah i yeah i i couldn't even go there last night or at all this week um but yeah just to explain what we're kind of talking about here directly is Bruce Bochy, former manager of the Giants, is back with the Rangers in town for the first time since he left the organization. Um, Left the organization on incredibly amicable terms. Um, Baggerly of the Athletic has said this multiple times this week, but the truly impressive stat of Bruce Bochy's career is that he's been a manager for 26 years and he's never been fired. And he he carried teams through the peaks and valleys better than almost any manager I've ever I've ever paid attention to. And I think that's the interesting thing is Kapler is still early in his time with the Giants is examining his ability to ride the wave. And I think he, whenever you listen to him talk, he really goes into kind of process and talks about if we if we do the right process, we'll I'm still working on my Kapler impression, but um <laughs> we'll uh you know, we'll achieve the results we want in the end or we'll, or we'll deserve the results that we achieve. And I think that is such an important kind of message and mentality through a baseball season, but it can only go so far, you know, ultimately Bochi managed some truly awful giants teams and he also managed some world series winners and will be a hall of famer because of it. Um, and yeah, just it, dealing with that, back and forth and the rigors of the day to day, I think is, is what truly kind of defines a successful 
organization, um, yeah. not just the wins and losses. Yeah, I think, you know, if I were to pull it up right now, um, I think if you look at Bruce Bochy's win-loss record, mm. um, it's currently, even with this great Rangers season that they've had, um, he's a career 500 manager, like on the dot. Like he's 27, 20, 2070, 2072 wins, 2076 losses. And wow. I kind of think that that's, um, there's an interesting parallel of Kapler to Boach in that, like, that really is an embodiment of like trusting the process, but also like um, endearing a certain amount of trust to you as an individual as well. Like, I think Bochi, you know, we we're talking about these kind of, leaner years of, of Giants baseball that we followed growing up. And I think um, there was, there was many, there were many times where people would question Bochi, but I think by and large, he kind of, he just, he just is a baseball manager. Yeah. He just is a coach of baseball in a way that like um, is kind of undeniable. Um, like, uh, in there's that article that Bagley ran as well um, with different people's quotes about um, him and uh, Wotus was talking about our uh, you know longtime bench coach Ron Wotus was talking about in 2007 he just like picked up like you know 2007 not the best year for Giants baseball um, and uh, he literally like picked up a bat and like destroyed a TV in the clubhouse and um, just to like let players know that there's some amount of accountability and I don't know, there's just like a, a, but that's not the type of manager that he is necessarily, but it's like part of his tool set. And I think, um, you know, just speaking to maybe trying to get tied together too many things, but I think sports fan, like we should go about being fans in the way that Bochi was, Mm. uh, was a manager, which is that he would, um, he really like, and Buster said this, but he really does the prep ahead of time and then just shows up and then just takes whatever's in front of him and then makes, uses information that's there and combines it with instinct to just react to the moment. And I think that's so closely, that so closely resembles Gabe Kapler's intention as a manager too, um, who has been a manager for five seasons now. And has already been fired once by the Phillies, so <laughs> yeah. won't get to Bochi's record. Um, Nobody I think, will these days. Yeah, I, it's it's an impossible. That's why that stat is so astounding. I think um, even like someone as legendary as Dusty Baker in the game has been fired as a manager. So anyway, I digress. But you know, Kapler's very similar to Bochi in that regard of the prep that he does. And he's very in tune with the front office and the analytics department. But once he's out there, he's not like typing into a computer and he's not making every decision based on analytics. It's very much feel. And both of these guys were former players. Um, And as much as I I think a lot of the Kapler haters in Giants fandom would argue that he is a pure robot who doesn't have any feel. I think that's just not true if you watch the team consistently um and so i i think that dichotomy has been really fascinating to check out while bochi's been in town because i think these two guys are kind of similar in the way they want to manage but i bet if you pulled giants fans you would you would get a very like old school versus new school dichotomy between the two managers and i just i think it might fit neatly into a narrative but i don't know if it's that closely tied to reality i don't know what do you think yeah I mean, it's um, yeah. I, I think I'm I'm with you. It's 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 a nuanced thing, and um, I think that there's like just reading all the quotes about Bochi is like there's so much we don't know about what goes on behind the scenes and like what it takes to make a person. Because um, the thing that struck me like reading all those quotes is like, and I knew this, but it's like like Bochi like really loves the game of baseball and Mm -hmm. i kind of think that that is like that's kind of this old school baseball lifer thing or whatever it's like why tony la russa's have been able to like stay in the game for as long as they have because it's like well not anymore but um but you know (laughs) just by virtue of just like 
they clearly are obsessed with this game. And like Bochi was like that type of like person. And I think that Kapler is closer than like you're saying is a lot closer to him than the average fan may believe. But I think at the same time, um, he, his approach to it is like kind of more like Silicon Valley than mom and pop just on the mm. surface. Do you know what I mean? And like, That's I think that great, that may yeah. rub people a certain way, but, um, and then even, you know, within this, this, it's very easy to draw this dichotomy, but um, was it yesterday or the day before that they pulled um, Haney, Heaney early yesterday, yeah. or whatever, or it was you know, Saturday's and like, game, yeah. and really pulled exactly from our textbook, which is just like poetic in a way of like, and then they, you know, they've been dominating us kind of, but um, it's, yeah, I don't know. I, I think that um, the differences are smaller than people believe in it also really comes down to i mean this is the same with the government or anything but it's like when when uh when gas is cheap you're not worried so much about who's in the position of power and um you know for this rangers team both talked about like how fortunate he is to like be just come into the situation where they spent a a bajillion dollars on these free Literally. agents building up these teams, <laughs> you know, these last few years. And like, it's, it's just a, we, the giants still haven't like pulled that trigger. Do you know what I mean? To like give, give the fullest version of the on-field product. We spent money, but it was kind of more circumstantial. And I think this we're building towards as an organization, the ability to really like, throw down some cash on the table yep. and be able to do that. And so I think that's a bigger difference than we allow for necessarily. Yeah. And I, I think that's a fantastic point and we're not there yet. We want to be there. We want, we wanted this past off season. I think even giants leadership wanted this past off season to be that off season, but the Rangers have guys who have been coming up through their system for a while now, like Nathaniel Lowe, uh, Adelise Garcia, um, they got Jonah Heim in a trade from the A's, but like some of these Jung. young players, Jung, well, Jung is a true rookie this year. So he's yeah. kind of like the culmination of this, but like, right, right, right. sure. You have these young guys who have kind of toiled on Tavares is another one on kind of like mediocre Rangers teams or even like bad Rangers teams. But now they're in year four or five of the big leagues. And now you've got Corey Seager, you've got Marcus Simeon, and then they completely revamped their rotation, which actually I think, they got fairly lucky with um and it's hard to say that because Degrom has been out all year and it's a shame because god he's so good but um i think the giants when this this group of rookies kind of keeps maturing that's when we throw all the chips down and similar to other sports and i think of football a lot in this comparison where you want to maximize your salary cap window in football. So when you have a rookie quarterback, which the Niners have right now with Brock Purdy and Trey Lance, guys on a rookie deal, you're not paying $50 million for your quarterback like with Patrick Mahomes. So you can spread that money out to like these other key positions. So right now the Niners have the best talent in football because mm. they don't pay their quarterbacks very much. It's also why they might not be able to win World Series as consistently because they don't have the top end quarterback play. Anyway, I, I digress. It'll be, it'll be really sad when the pop. Niners don't win the, the football world series. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Anyway, analogy back to baseball. Um, the giants have all these rookies coming up, so we will, we will have money to spend. We haven't thrown a contract at Bumgarner. We don't have Correa sitting on our books for the next 13 years being like, Oh my God. This guy might have termite ankles and is hitting 210 this year. Like, I, I think we have to appreciate in this season the like the positives from the negatives almost. Where, yes, some of our young guys aren't hitting right now. Although one that we're going to talk about in a second just hit his first career major league home run this uh, this weekend. But you know, we want to bring these guys up so that in three years we are in the Rangers position and it's hard to say that like, let's keep the faith, you know, three years, but like all the while, I think Farhan and Gabe are always doing things to incrementally add to the team to where we have 
advantages game to game, series to series, which put us in the position that we're in right now. Like I said, we're still eight games above 500 and kind of firmly in the playoff picture still, despite being on kind of a, a losing streak. So um, still still a lot to to be positive about, in my opinion. Yeah, no, I, I mean, I think it's um, just kind of bringing together a couple of things we've talked about. I mean, like it's people always talk about in sports that like, you know, winning cures all. Like if you're winning, it's like it's easy to look past, you know, the the scratches and the the th- the things where there's rub between certain players and friction or whatever. Do you know what I mean? And um, I just think that we're at an interesting point with this team this year because um, we're winning more than a lot of sometimes. other teams sometimes. Yes, but when you know, it's like when you're talking about wood and like his kind of being like, I don't know, I kind of wish I could pitch every fifth day or something. Do you know what I mean? Like it's, we're at a point where it's like, and everything that I hear from the front office and the the coaches and everything and the staff is like that this is a really selfless group, but there's a limit to, to that. I, I think when the wins aren't coming in and then it starts to feel like, why are we doing all this just to, excuse me, just to lose still or whatever and you know you look back at um 2021 and it's just like was anybody in that clubhouse complaining probably but not that much because yeah you know we're we won 107 wins that year and i think that even though that there's some things by committee and like platoony stuff happening it's like people buy in when the results are there and right now the you look at you look at the standings and on paper the results have been there this season but it it's just like sports fans sports players sports anybody just like have such a short memory for what just happened like i mean you know 8 weeks in baseball is like years <laughs> kind of like spiritually um and just to, just to talk about like clubhouse stuff and whatever um i just wanted to call out this one part from the athletic article that I'll put on screen. Um, This quote from Buster Posey about, um, (laughs) are you familiar? Um, (laughs) About, I know his work. uh, (laughs) I'm going to, I'm going to read it. If that's, if that's cool. Just, I think it gives the Mm -hmm. context. Um, Another, another memory thing that comes to mind is a behind the scenes moment. We were having a tough time with a certain player as it'll happen from time to time. I went to Boach and asked what his thoughts were. I was more of the mindset of, hey, man, you need to drop the hammer on this guy. And Boach looked at me and said, I can't, Buster. I can't do it. I'll lose him. I'll completely lose him. Boach says, what's going to be better for the team, having this guy on the field or not? And that was a learning moment for me. As a leader, you have to be malleable and flexible in your approach to different guys. It can't be one size fits all. Even if on the surface, a pretty unpopular decision among the group, he was still thinking about the big picture. That's a tough call too, right? What if you lose the group, you know? And I'm sure he assessed all those risks and did what he thought would be best for the team overall. And I was like, whoa, just such like a, such a, a, a juicy quote. And I um, thought it would be, um, I thought that we could, as as fans, kind of like reverse engineer what he was talking about and just like explore that. And, you know, just uh, what that says about, you know, uh, coach, manager, interaction with uh, players and stuff in general. Yeah, I I almost feel like that co- that quote speaks for itself after you read it out. I mean, it just is like you you can't do a one size fits all approach with anything. Yeah, whether that's life, whether that's managing a baseball team, whatever. You know, you have to. You were saying this before, but like, do the prep work, be prepared, and then in the moment adjust accordingly. And right. I think that's that's a beautiful metaphor for all of life, not just not just el baseball. But I think that's a beautiful take, but now I want to know who you think that he was talking about. Yeah, I was avoiding this. Um, I think I think Aubrey Huff would be a funny one if mm. that's who this was about. Like, just as a wackadoodle, toxic dude that he is. Like, oh, if I like bring the hammer down on him, I might lose him because he couldn't take criticism or anyone challenging his manhood yeah well but 
I don't know. You know, That's I think that we may have to shut down the pod because two Huff mentions two weeks in a row is really <laughs> yeah. too, too many of this guy. I mean, Huff he pod. was Huff pod. <laughs> Welcome to Fa- Foggy with a chance of Huff balls. Um, but I think that he, he, yeah, I think that that's a definitely a possible one. Another one that came to mind was Pablo Sandoval. Mm. Just like, um, just because the weight idea stuff of losing early him, on. Yeah, mm-hmm. the, the weight stuff was always this thing. But I feel like Bochi always kind of stood up for Pablo. Yeah. Um, even when he was, you know, there were antics or things going on off the field. Like, he always stood up for him. And um, ultimately, we did quote-unquote, lose him to the Red Sox. And it de- definitely felt like the spiritual loss or something. Um, that's one that comes to mind. Another one could be, like, um, I don't know if they cared enough about Hunter Strickland to <laughs> say Hunter <laughs> Strickland. A good point, but though, too. Yeah. It could be. It could be just because um, I think he was... There, there's clearly issues in the in the clubhouse with him that preceded him leaving the team with the Harper stuff and everything like that. Um, and then I had one more name, but does anybody else come to mind for you? No, I I like keep yeah keep going at this. I like it. Um, the last name that I thought of was like maybe Pagan, like Angel Pagan, Uh-oh. just in the sense of like um, I I have only fond memories of Angel Pagan uh, as a giant, just like what a swaggy dude um, who's, who's uh, the effect of his inside the park home run on his uh, career. I think we don't talk about enough, but um, so, but I, I just feel like he, he's one of those, like, I'm going to do things the way that I want to do them type players or whatever. And um, I could see him being that too, but um I don't know. I, I do this less to like be TMZ about this and like try to like, <laughs> you know, find gossip. But um, I don't know, like you really, those are the names that come to mind from Bochi's whole tenure of being a manager. Do you know what I mean? And it's just like, yeah. you look around the league and um, I don't know, like there's stuff with um, the Cardinals this year that we've talked about um, of uh, O'Neal getting like left out to dry by his manager um, I think that's happened with the White Sox time and time again with different mm-hmm. managers, um, you know, and it's, I think that was, I think to a fault when I think about Bochi, um, and I think the Kapler actually does, again, share this more than we give him credit for, but he's a player advocate at the end of the day is really what it feels like to me. And I think when you have to show up for, ideally 162 but you know however many games you're up for that season you really want to know that like there's confidence in your ability and who you are as a person and i think that you know that was always the knock on bochi is that he like stuck with the veterans too long or something but at the end of the day there's a trust that they had in him that like what you know could never be lost because he just showed up in any situation and um i don't know like just like created a clubhouse that was comfortable enough um where there weren't these public publicized situations of him and other people and like obviously with baseball stuff goes on behind closed doors all the time there's a bunch of things that i don't know about but like that's kind of like that's a skill in today's day and age when the media is looking to pounce on any narrative if you can squash your beef in the clubhouse and it doesn't come out until years later that means that you're good at your job and i think that that like that people part of the job is such a huge part of it and um i think that we're just going about it in a different way now it's like we've got a drew robinson to talk about mental health stuff if with if you want to and here's this person to work on this specific thing so it's like there's always human attention but um there was a i forget i know i've referenced this article a bunch of times but um it's he somebody was talking about after 2010 um when we won the the uh, the World Series in in Texas, uh, funnily enough, of him just like smiling like a kid, just like <laughs> going up to everybody on the plane, every every team member, and just like sharing that moment with them. And like, I really think that that's the special quality that like has made him such an adored and loved manager. And I think, and I think that like as Kapler feels more and more comfortable here, I think we'll like kind of get to see that because it just. Bochi is like not like 
an affable guy. Do you know what I mean? Like that's not yeah. how you describe him. You wouldn't describe him as particularly warm or anything, but he is. But his just imprint like in his was own warm way. over the course of his tenure with the Giants. Yeah, exactly. And I think that it's like it's really about um, you know what what happens on the field. And when the things that happen on the field match up with the process, then it'll feel like it all works. And then as soon as it doesn't, it's easy to be like, tear it all down. Um, I think you had uh, sent this uh, Bonte Hill tweet about um, Farhan not being extended and this whatever, this anti, this movement of stuff. And it's just like, you just have to wait. And like, and I think that, um, I don't know, it's, it's a weird, we're in a much different space right now as Giants fans than we were, you know, in 2008 or something like that. But um, it's not nearly as like, um, nearly dire. as dire. Yeah, great word. Um, uh, but we now live in a situation where the pod, the Dodgers are competing every single year. They're going to turn out, you know, these close to 100 win teams every year, which wasn't the case, you know, the whole time that um, that the Bochy Giants were coming up. Padres um, will be around, but like, I think we're, we're in a competitive situation. Yeah. We're in a situation where um, there's an easier chance to make the playoffs than there has been in the past. Doesn't mean that it's easy, but it feels worse when you don't get it. And so I don't know. It's just we're we're in a different climate of baseball now, and um, I just think it called. I mean, I know that we've said this a thousand times, but it just called for a different hand to guide through this style of baseball. But it's cool to see that Bochi can still do it in the way. I'm sure he had very specific things of like how he wanted his process to be, how he wanted to do things. And it still works too, but it just has to like match the on-field product at the end of the day. Yeah, I agree. Um, if I can change the subject a little bit to highlight Please. a performer from this past week is uh, young Elliot Ramos um, got called up after AJ Pollock got hurt. I think there is a bit of hilarious irony that in the game where we start Pollock in center, Conforto in right, and Jock in left, that Pollock ends up pulling a hamstring and is at, or no straining an oblique is what happened to him. Luciano pulled a hamstring, but strains an oblique and is out for like three to four weeks. And it's like, cool. Our one deadline bat that was supposed to help us is not here anymore. And I think it's, it's actually a blessing. Um, and Elliot Ramos gets brought up. He on Friday night um, in the ninth inning hits this, scorched double that ends up being misplayed by the um, center fielder. He ends up getting a leadoff triple. We were down by two. Tyro brings him in, but then we couldn't score a second run. We lose, but Elliot makes something happen. And at the end of the game uh, yesterday, we're losing nine to two. Elliot hits his first big league home run, which I couldn't believe it was his first big league home run. Cause he's, he made his debut last spring. Um, and he's been called up five times, which is kind of crazy yeah, to think about. And never given that much of a leash. And so we're talking about kind of what positives to glean from this valley of a run right now. Yeah. Um, but I think we forget that Elliot Ramos, even though he was drafted in 2017 and his, it feels like he had his time to be that like make it or break it prospect. And he didn't make it. But he's 23 years old and we're lauding Bailey and Schmidt and they're a year older than him. And we have this core right now. And I think these pieces really fit well together too. Like Ramos projects to be a very solid right fielder, Matos center field. We've talked about the up the middle defense with Bailey, Schmidt, Luciano. And like these guys are very young, but if this is the movement of players, if, if we can cultivate this run, you know, over years, not just run between week to week in this current season, but like yeah. if Elliot Ramos can get the confidence to be a solid major league contributor, that makes the season an unequivocal success. And that's been true about Schmidt already, even though he's back in AAA. I would say this season's been success for him. Bailey, obviously, we've talked about him. Matos is struggling a little bit right now, but we've seen it now with all these different prospects that that's part of your rookie season is 
you show something, the league figures you out. Now it's your turn to figure the league back out. And then next, you know, when you figure them out, they'll figure you right back. And it's just this like constant push and pull. But I just wanted to quickly shout out to uh, Elliot Ramos because I think we forget about him when it comes to our young players um, because he was brought up first and didn't really succeed when he first came up. But he's still a young player, has crazy power in that bat, and I think has a lot of potential still left in his baseball career. Um, And got to find silver linings when we lose nine to three. All right. So I'm grasping at straws here. (laughs) (laughs) No, it's good. I mean, I think the the point I think I got lost in what I was trying to say, but um, is that, yeah, I mean, it just, it doesn't feel dire. It feels like there's that the process is working. And that's the thing that like kind of helps me from destitution (laughs) with this team. Yeah. Even though the, the games can make you feel that way. I think it's like, um, I know we've talked about this before on, um, but I think a lot about that, that Giannis quote about like, what is success in a sports team? Like just because you don't win it all, does that mean that the season wasn't success? And I I don't think that that's true. I think that like unequivocal, definitely, definitely failure. Everyone fails. (laughs) Exactly. I agree with what you're saying. Sorry. No, it's just like every organization is a continuum of like every decision that you make leads you to the next thing. And like how you, you know, for like a rebuilding team, how what you do during that time is just as important as what you do when you have the chips to to push in and like how you deal with that. Um, because, you know, everybody wants to be the Cubs or the Astros and just like go through a rebuild and there's a World Series on the other side of it. But, um, you know, like look at like, I, know, I feel like I give them a lot of shit on this podcast, but like the White Sox or something is like they were lining everything up and then they just couldn't, they couldn't, and doesn't mean that it's all done, but it feels kind of like they oh, missed their window. Done. And so you have to <laughs> yeah. start start over again. And so it's like, I think patience is really important to like see things through. And I think that I'd love to see a player like Ramos succeed. And I think that it's possible. Um, and I think like we talked about when it happened, the Pollock thing wasn't really about Pollock. It was just like filling a need kind of quickly. And then mm-hmm. we have these guys that we can throw out there and just see what they got. And I, I think that there's, Um, like the point that you made before, it's nice that like these guys will have experience prior to like when they're really needed to like show up as like everyday members of the team. And I think that it felt like that for a while. Maybe that's why they're pressing a little bit, but I think as the things evolve, it's going to be, it'll be good. It's yeah, it'll be good. I've seen people suggest online that the giants kind of this stretch right now is about to be really hard. Um, we've got the Rangers, the Rays come into town next week. Then we go to Atlanta and Philly and then come back home and play the Braves. And then I think host the Cubs or go out there. This next stretch of games basically until September is rough (laughs) and not Darren. Darren. It's yeah, (laughs) we both went there. Um, and I've seen people pause it on line of, should we, completely kind of throw in the towel and just bring up all the young guys and let them and let them kind of go through their warts. And I see you shaking your head. Yeah. Where are you on that? (laughs) Sorry. No, just involuntary. I mean, I just feel like it's, it's easy to like look at all the reasons why this team is weak, but it's like, we're still in playoff position. So it's like you, you just got to, you just got to get into the dance and then you can cut a rug. Do you know what I mean? Like you just we have learned to put yourself there. In all of those world series teams. Yeah. Yeah. You just and have so, to get there. Yeah. And I think it's, it makes it less um, binary as a fan to receive of like what we're doing with this team is like, cause we yeah. kind of are a little bit stuck between these two places. Um, but I don't feel, I don't necessarily feel that it's stuck. I think it's just, um, I think we're trying to we're trying to do the two timelines thing that the Warriors did and it failed. Do you know what I mean? And um, yeah. but I think that it's more possible with baseball because there's more moving parts and you're not relying on these like foundational pieces. So um, yep. yeah, I don't know. I mean, I want to see young guys up too, and I think that they can help. And some of them maybe are better than our current options. So if it makes sense in a baseball sense, and they'll do it because that's what this F front office's MO is. So, um, yeah, whoever makes sense to call up, call them up. But I don't think that, it, like, we don't have to bring up Harrison just because 
he has this thing or whatever. It's like, who makes sense? Ramos makes sense because Pollock goes down. Do you know what I mean? Like that makes sense to me. Yeah. What's your I thought? will say Kyle had a really nice start in AAA this past week. Pitched almost three perfect innings. Uh, no walks, which I think is the most important thing um, as he's building up his pitch count after yeah. being on the injured list a little bit. So, um, yeah, he might be. I yeah. mean, but like they we might have another right. debut. Yeah, yeah, they do. Um, and I'm hopeful that it's soon. But our whole, you know, intention behind the show is by Giants fans for Giants fans. And I think we get caught up so much in the like emotions of a season and so much of a baseball season is just finding the things to entertain yourself with. And yeah. it's easy on a good team because winning is more fun than losing. But I think we do need to stay, take a step back, even in these valleys um, that are going on, even these losing streaks, especially when the offense can't hit because that's some of the worst baseball to watch in history. But being able to still appreciate what, has still been fun about this season and what will be fun. Um, so yeah, I appreciated that. That was your little fireside chat for giants fans. So my um, little fireside chat with <laughs> Gabe Kepler, <laughs> but no, I, I think that's important. And um, it'll, I think that this, w- what we want to do with this podcast ultimately is to, um, to all our, our thousands of listeners out there right now. Um, millions. Just wanted to say millions um, that, uh, I think that this, I think we're at our best when we're appreciating things. And I think that that's what like, we're always getting to. And um, hopefully, hopefully we found today just a couple of things to appreciate. And that can be enough to sustain us. If, even if the Rangers <laughs> giant series is not. Um, but, Amen. Can I end on a quote that I, Oh yeah. That I uh, heard. So earlier this weekend, at some point, in the last couple of days, John Smoltz was calling a game on Fox and said he would have much rather faced a hitter who was oh, or he would much rather when he was a pitcher faced a hitter who was ten for his last twenty than oh for his last twenty. And that sounds ridiculous in a vacuum, but mm. I think speaks to the conversation we were just having that when you're on a losing streak, the logical conclusion is that you will be winning very soon. And when you are on a winning streak, you will be losing very soon. And there's always a back and forth with baseball. And so let's just ride the wave. Enjoy what we enjoy. And uh, shouts to Bruce Bochy, man. Hey, what a legend. Shout out. Hey, Bruce, if you're listening, um, <laughs> please join Bruce, us when next week. when you're listening, <laughs> not if. When, right, right, right. He put it on his calendar that he had to check this out. They've got a um, flight, you know. He's got to get some content. <laughs> he's got he's got a lot of space in that big, big head. Um, anyway, <laughs> thank you for joining us, and we'll see you next week uh, with another episode of Foggy with a Chance of Seagulls. Thank you so much for joining us on another episode of Foggy with a Chance of Seagulls. If you haven't already, please follow us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever you listen to your podcasts. We have a video version available on YouTube. Follow us on Instagram for little clips that we'll be putting up every week. And it actually really helps if you leave us ratings, reviews, comments, anything. It all helps. Thank you for listening so much, and we'll see you next week.